You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. You know, if you're a cyber criminal, you could make the case that uh, November 30th, 2022 was the greatest day in your life because that was the day that OpenAI announced ChatGPT. And I'm not trying to throw ChatGPT in particular under the bus, but that was the day, the moment that set off generative AI mania. If you were a cyber criminal, your, your, your eyes lit up and you realize that there's now this whole new type of tool that either is already available or will soon be available to you to do um, some really dramatic uh, things. Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to the Hacking Humans podcast brought to you by N2K CyberWire. Every week, we delve into the world of social engineering scams, phishing plots, and criminal activities that are grabbing headlines and causing significant harm to organizations all over the world. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hey, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, my conversation with Robert Blumoff, he is Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Technology officer at Akamai. But first, a word from our sponsors at Know Before. We're not talking conspiracy theory when we say it's all connected. When it comes to InfoSec tools, effective integrations can make or break your security stack. Though not as common, the same should be true for security awareness training. Not only does Know Before deliver the world's largest library of security awareness training, but they also provide a way to integrate the various elements of your existing security stack to help you strengthen your organization's security culture. Stay with us, and in a few minutes, we'll hear from our sponsors at Know Before about how you can integrate security awareness with your tech stack like never before. All right, Joe, uh, we are going to jump right into our stories here this week. Excellent. And I am going to lead things off. Please do, Dave. Um, so this is something that just sort of came by one of my feeds and it caught my eye. I thought it was something that would be good for our show. Let me, let me start off by asking you, how would you define stupid? Ah, how would I define stupid? Good question. I actually have a definition to this. Okay. Um, there is, there is an old saying that, uh, I think it was Einstein that said, doing the th- same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insanity. Yes. And okay. my response that. to that is, no, that's not insanity. Insanity is running up to people in a banana suit and kissing them and, and doing all kinds of other crazy stuff. <laughs> okay. Right? So, what so, Einstein okay. was talking about there is just the inability, inability to learn, or it's, as is known by its more common phrase, stupidity. So it is, that is what doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is. Mm. And when, whenever I do something and the same thing happens again and I'm surprised by it, the first thing I say is, well, that's the stupidity. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, your definition sort of aligns with what I'm going to be talking about here today. So um, there is a podcast called The Knowledge Project Podcast. Okay. It's hosted by uh, Shane Parrish. Uh, and uh, Shane posted a, an excerpt from a recent episode. Uh, this was with uh, someone named Adam Robinson, uh, and he is a well-known author, educator, entrepreneur, and a hedge fund advisor, hey. so rich guy. Rich guy, yeah. <laughs> guy with more money than he knows That's what right. to do with, so he starts uh, a hedge fund. He co-founded the Princeton Review, uh, and uh, actually his book on the test preparation industry was a New York Times bestseller. He is a rated chess master, so not just a rich guy, also smart guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he uh, was mentored by uh, Bobby Fischer. Really? Yeah. Well, that's um, impressive. Yeah. So he uh, did his undergrad at the Wharton School uh, of the University of Pennsylvania and has a law degree from Oxford. So, you know, all around smart person. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, he was invited to speak at an investment conference in the Bahamas, and he chose uh, his topic to be how not to be stupid. Mm, I should probably have attended that talk. <laughs> so <laughs> why I thought this was interesting for us, because we say many, many times on the show, we talk about how 
when people find themselves having fallen victim to some sort of scam, usually one of the first things they say is, I feel stupid. I feel stupid. Right. Right. And our reply is, don't. You're not stupid. You're human. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I thought this aligning with that, that notion, that impulse that people have, that feeling of feeling stupid right. when they have fallen prey to some kind of a scam. And so um, Robinson, Adam Robinson, uh, did this presentation, uh, structured this presentation about how not to be stupid. And, and he defined stupidity as overlooking or dismissing conspicuously crucial information. Hmm. And that kind of aligns with what you were saying, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Right. Right. That's conspicuously crucial information. I would say yes. Right. I mean, it's, it's not, they're not completely off base from each other. Yeah. But he had seven factors that he says contribute to stupidity. Okay. I'm going to list them here. Oh, I want to hear them. Being outside one's normal environment or changing routines. Ah. Okay. Okay. Presence in a group. Group think. Yeah, group. Being present in a group will make you stupid. The presence of an expert or being an expert oneself. So, so wait a minute, wait a minute. So the presence of an expert yep. makes you stupid. Could. And These are things that contribute to stupidity. It contributes so stupid to behavior, stupidity. right? Okay. Yep. Being an expert oneself. I think that's interesting because perhaps it's coming from overconfidence. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, tasks requiring intense focus. Hmm. This makes sense to me. Yeah, I would agree with that one. Yep. Information overload. Right. Physical or emotional stress or fatigue. Uh, 100%. Yep. And urgency or rushing. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> we hear that a lot, don't we? Right. So I would say, I don't know, half of these really fall into things that we talk about all the time. Right. Um, and what he says, what Robinson says, is that these factors are additive and can significantly increase the risk of errors. That is interesting. Yeah. Uh, one of the examples that he used was in hospitals, particularly here in the U.S., that all of these factors are present in hospitals. And actually, there are a lot of accidental deaths here in the U.S. Yes. Uh, as a result of many of these things. Yeah, it's like the third lead, leading cause, third or fourth leading cause of death. Yeah, exactly. In, in the country. Right, just medical mistakes. Medical mistakes, right. Yeah. Um, he provides another example. Uh, he has an anecdote about um, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cellist. Yes. Uh, who was uh, on his way to a performance one time and he was running late. And he took a cab to the, uh, let's just say it was Carnegie Hall. Right. Uh, and uh, sprints out of the cab to go do the performance and left Leaves his cello. cello. I've, I've heard this story about Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> left his cello. Like, and, and the anecdote is how could that be possible, right? How could, how could it be possible that Yo-Yo Ma, a professional cellist, right, <laughs> has probably spent more time with that cello than his mom, right? Right. <laughs> right? Like, like, how could he possibly leave his cello behind? I totally empathize with Yo-Yo Ma on this. Yeah. Because I have left so many things behind. <laughs> right. And, and it, my fifth grade teacher, Helen Norris, would say to me, you would forget your head if it wasn't attached. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this conversation, again, this was a podcast, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes. Um, what they really talked about was um, careful decision-making um, and the risks of multitasking mm -hmm. and also overloading your cognitive capacities. One of the, the interesting things they noted here, it was kind of an aside, but it really caught my attention, was how, like, if you're trying to concentrate on something, I know this is true for me. Right. If I'm trying to concentrate on something, like, I'll turn off the radio. Like, yeah. let's say I'm in the car, right. you know, and uh, I'm coming up on a, a difficult intersection or something like that. I will like turn that. the radio off for that, too. Yeah. Whenever yeah. I'm looking for the house number, I got to turn the radio off. Right, right. They talked about how um, merely having a passenger in your car greatly increases the odds of you having a car accident. Yeah, sure because it Because you'll be distracted. They also uh, talked about the difference between having a passenger in your car and having someone on the phone in your car. And having someone on the phone is way more dangerous than having a passenger. Really? Yeah. Because the passenger being there with you 
can sense when you're in a situation that requires decision making, right? You're coming up on a tricky intersection uh. or, you know, it's raining hard or something like that. But someone on the, the phone is clueless. Right. That those things may be happening and they just keep blah, 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 blah. They keep talking to you, pulling away your attention. Right. Keep distracting you. And it makes it much more dangerous. Right. We had um, doctors Lee and DeBurra uh, at at Hopkins did a research project on the effectiveness of distraction on phishing emails. uh, And they found out that, yeah, distracting people really increases the effectiveness of, of a phishing email. Right. Right. Well, and I mean, again, if we look at this list that uh, they put out here, I mean, some information overload, and that's what the scammers do. Right. Physical or emotional stress, that's, that's what, what the, the scammers, scammers do. do, right? Right. Uh, they get you to do things. They And they, of course, there's always that urgency or rushing saying, you know, you need yep. to do this now. And they, they make you focus on it. And uh, they, uh, yeah, the urgency. And then they are the expert on things. Right. Right. Like we had that story about, I can't remember her name anymore, but the reporter who uh, gave away $50,000 in a shoebox. Right. That guy portrayed himself exactly as an expert. Right. And if, if you do that, I can't help you anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I really thought this was interesting and, and had an interesting crossover with the kind of things we talk about here every day. So yeah, sure again, uh, the, 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 uh, it's actually a, a blog post based on a podcast. <laughs> so we're going to we're gonna link to the blog, blog post to, called How Not to Be Stupid. And then there's links in there if you want to actually check out the conversation. There, there's a lot more to this conversation, but this little excerpt here really was right up our alley. So I highly nice. recommend you check it out. Again, it's the Knowledge Project podcast uh, hosted by Shane Parrish. And the guest was Adam Robinson. All right, that's what I have this week. Joe, what do you've got for us? Dave, my story comes from a listener who sent this in named Michael. Mm. Uh, It was a story by Haley Compton at the BBC. Okay. And it goes like this, Dave. There's a lovely couple named Lucy and Chris who are both teachers in Derbyshire. You know what Derbyshire is? I do not. Me neither. I I don't know. It's in England somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they had recently had a baby. And Chris realized, as as one does when uh, you have a baby, that you don't have much more time for video games, Dave. (laughs) Video games? Video games. Okay. That's that's how Hank Hill says video games. Okay. (laughs) Uh, So Chris said, I'm going to put my gaming laptop and I'm going to sell it. You know, we could use the money. I don't use this anymore. We're going to sell it. Okay. So they put it on Facebook Marketplace and they get a hit from this guy. Mm -hmm. And he asks all the right questions about it. Right? Like, what's the graphics processor in it? Okay. How much RAM do you have? I want to hear. I want to hear about it. Right. Um, so knowledgeable inquiries. Knowledgeable inquiries. Yeah. Lucy did some OSINT, right? Open okay. source intelligence gathering, and she poked around his Facebook profile, found pictures of this guy with his wife and his kids, showed where he lived, where he worked. Everything looked great. So he comes over to their house, and they they say, "You want a drink?" And he's like, "Yeah, I'll take a drink." And uh, he interacts with the baby. You know, with the three-month-old baby. Mm. And they agree on a price of 700 pounds. Mm. Okay. That's, um, that's... What's that in real money, Joe? I don't know, Dave. I, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> you know, I keep... Whenever I hear about this stuff, I say, just reference our communication from July 4th, 1776. I don't care about that anymore. <laughs> see, very nice. I don't care how much a pound is worth. Very nice. There very I am. Nice. They're doing the ugly American thing again. <laughs> I'm really good They're at They're going to meet you at the border one day. <laughs> right. Say, Mr. Kerrigan, you can turn right back around <laughs> right. and head back to... You're not welcome you, in Canada. Your Yankee Doodle. Yes. yes. Yankee Doodle. <laughs> a song... Uh, a song made up to make fun of us. <laughs> right. So this guy opens up what looks like a banking app from a well-known bank, and Mm. Chris sees the main page, and uh, then he sees the transformation, or the transfer page, the Mm -hmm. transfer confirmation page, and Chris actually enters his banking details, and the guy shows him a confirmation page, and there's a picture of this confirmation page in the article. Okay. Uh, Chris apparently took a picture of it. Fifteen minutes later, the funds had not arrived in the bank, but now the baby's getting hungry. Uh, and Lucy uh, the, does not want to nurse the baby with a stranger in the house. Okay. Which I totally understand. Sure. So they say, okay, we'll just wait for the for the money to show up. Have a good day. The Send guy him leaves. on his way. Okay. Yeah. Later that day, the money still hasn't shown up, right? Oh. So they uh, they call the guy, and their number is blocked. Oh. They're blocked on Facebook as well. Uh, what I find most disconcerting about this is they reported the, pro- the crime to their bank, to the insurance company, to the police, and to Facebook. 
but they say no one investigated. Now, it's a 700-pound laptop. Yeah. And by that, I don't mean you can't lug it around. It's it's not really... <laughs> it's an old K-Pro. <laughs> right? It's an Osborne one, there Dave. There you go. Right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, the police say that they have uh, just willingly given away their property. That's the police determination. Not that this guy came in and essentially stole a laptop from right. him. Right, he committed fraud. He did. He committed yeah. fraud. They're like, nope, you gave away your property. Uh, they didn't lose any money, so the bank can't really help them. Uh, they can change their account number because he did enter his account number into this app. Uh, uh, yeah, right. Facebook, <laughs> the ever helpful Facebook, Dave. <laughs> they said, we need, the guy, we need the link to the guy's profile. Well, guess what? They can't get it because he's blocked them. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Facebook can get this information. Facebook has the information. Facebook sure. knows the marketplace, knows the conversation. They see, they can see, they can easily go through and find out everybody that conversed with them about this item and see who has blocked them. It's all in their database. It's all there. They could find this guy. Sure. No problem. Uh, Facebook but they did probably nothing. has his GPS coordinates. <laughs> right. They probably, <laughs> at, any, yeah. at any moment. <laughs> they know whether he's straight or gay. They know right? where he lives. Yeah, yeah exactly. they know where he lives. They, they know, know his favorite pizza toppings are. They, yeah. know, they know so much about this guy. Right. Sure. Right. Sorry, we, we can't help you. <laughs> right. The one thing the cops did, the ever helpful cops here, the police said, uh, you should call action fraud to help avoid this in the future. Okay. Uh, and Action Fraud had this to say about that they, the BBC act, reached out to Action Fraud, which is a UK scam prevention service. Okay. Right? And you can report your scams there. I don't know that they have a lot of enforcement ability, but they can track things. Uh, it's kind of like the Internet Crime Complaint Center, uh, but I think it's more proactive than that. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not really sure. All right. Uh but they said that in 2019, they received just under 5,000 reports of Facebook marketplace scams. Last year, 20,000. Yeah. 20,000 of these scams. Wow. Uh, there's a quote from Nick Stapleton, who is a co-presenter on the BBC's uh, Scam Interceptors. I don't know if that's a show or a podcast or what. Mm -hmm. But Nick had this to say. He says, behave online as you would in real life. Assume that you're dealing with someone you don't know. Presume that they are not trustworthy until proven otherwise. Facebook Marketplace is an add-on to an existing social media site. You need to treat it like the classified ads of a newspaper. You have no idea who's listed that advert. Right. So just because you see their picture, just because you see pictures of their wife and kids, there, there's no guarantee of authenticity there. Sure. It's... It, it could be a completely fabricated pro, uh, profile. And for all we know, this guy just shut his profile down and deleted all of his data from Facebook, right? Now, I bet they still have it. But <laughs> Count on it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why they're not helping is because right, then right. they'd have to, have to tell you this. Have to reveal, yeah. So here, here's the quote from Meta because <laughs> I love these quotes from Meta. Sure. We don't want anyone to fall victim to these criminals, which is why our platforms have a system to block scams. Uh -huh. People can report this content to uh, in a few simple clicks, and we work with the police to support their investigations, which means we don't work with you to support the investigations. Right. We, we'll work, if the police send us a warrant, we'll give it to them. Right, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. We have a trained team of reviewers who check these reports 24-7 and move quickly to remove content or accounts which violate our guidelines. Uh, it sounds exactly... Like this was copied and pasted out of something in a res into a response sure. to the BBC. Yeah. This is... It's also the biggest load of crap I've ever heard in my is. life, Joe. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. I, I am, I am, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because that is exactly what I thought when I read this. <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> Facebook does not care no. if, if you lose a $700 laptop because somebody uh, exploited their system. They do not. They, no. they don't. No, I will tell you, uh, you know, I, I, as you know, uh, in the past year, I got back on Facebook. Yes. And it, it absolutely uh, pains me to be there. You're loving it, right, Dave? Uh, <laughs> I, I think I might have said this last week that someone I saw recently describe, they said uh, Facebook, or I think they actually said social media, but Facebook yeah. in particular, is like chemotherapy. Right. Right. It has its purposes, but at, at its base, it is poison. Right. And I think that is true. Um, and there are scams that I see come by every day on Facebook 
and Facebook does nothing about them. No. They come by several times a day. No. I it, diligently reported them for a while. Yeah. And then I shifted my efforts from di- diligently reporting them to diligently hiding them because I'm sick of seeing them, <laughs> right? And and that's that and that's what happens. Right. Uh I I will say um my oldest son is very active on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, he does a lot of buying and selling. Right. And he is the first person to say, cash only. Yes. Cash only. Cash only. None That's, of these None of these apps. payment apps? Nope. Nothing. Nope. Cash only and meet in a neutral location that is not your home. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, here in the U.S., a lot of local police stations have little places in their parking lot. Yep. That are set up for people to do these sorts of exchanges, buying and selling, so yep. that it's a safe place, a monitored place. And if you got a crook, chances are they're not going to want to meet you at the police station. Right. Right. That's right. Right. So meet me at the police station, cash only. And you'll hear all kinds of excuses for, oh my gosh, I don't have any cash. Uh, listen, I, I, you know, the, the ATM was broken. Uh, how about we just use this? this uh, app here real quick. Come on, I'm a good guy. Right, and, right. And, and no, cash, cash. only. That's Where's it. Where's the cash? Show me the cash. Yeah. Or we're done here. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really the only way to do it. And that's really the only way to make yourself secure in these situations. Right. Um, and, and trust no one on Facebook. No, you can't. I mean, right. e- even people who claim to be your friends. Yeah. It might not be them. It might not be them. <laughs> that's right. Your <laughs> friends may have had their account, account compromised. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, just uh, I well look. I I told you about the the dog thing that I fell for a yeah. couple weeks ago. Uh, another thing happened a couple weeks ago. I was like, oh, I said I was sitting on the couch with my wife, and I said, oh look, uh, you know, Uncle So and So's uh, just sent me a friend request. She says, yeah, that's a scam. You're already friends with him. I got one too. <laughs> Delete it. Right. I was like, okay, <laughs> like, I'm, you know, and oh, so so many J- Joe. Yeah. Makes me feel stupid. It do- <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I got one from somebody that is not related to me, but a guy I know who he is. Yeah. And uh, I got another friend request from him. Same profile pic. Yeah. And it was one of those, hey, I found, uh, I saw your name on the fund distribution page. And mm. I, I said, uh, really interesting. I, I sent him a link to one of my talks with the attorney general. <laughs> <laughs> And he blocked me. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. The Attorney General of Maryland. Former Attorney General. <laughs> All right. Well, that is an interesting story, and we will have a link to the story in the show notes. Of course, we would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to consider for the show, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. All right, Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from someone also named Michael, but not the same Michael. <laughs> it's all Michaels all the way down to There you go. But Michael sent this along, and it's a fairly standard catch of the day. But what I wanted to share more importantly than the catch of the day is what Michael said about it. Okay. He said, I thought I'd pass this along. I was under a lot of stress and surrounded by chaos when I received it. It really had me panic, but I followed all the recommendations, slowed down, and started looking for the signs. Thanks for keeping us educated and the constant reminders that it can happen to any of us at any time. So, uh, Dave, why don't you go ahead and read the uh, the Geek Tech memo. That, yeah, uh, so I'm going to read it, and then, but there's a lot of stuff in here that deserves a second look. So right. I'm going to start it. So it's, there's a title, a header, a graphic that says Geek Tech. Right. Date, March 30th, 24. Bill to Michael. Receipt number. Hey, Michael, your WinTech 24 plan renewal request has been started as your automatic renewal option has been activated. We have charged you $357.63 with your account for your plan renewal request. Item overview, product name, user, provider, validity, customer number, total $357.63, order status, confirmed, mode of payment, online. You have 48 hours if you did not authorize this charge. Please contact us at to cancel the plan. And then there's a, a phone number. Right. Now, let's go through this. Okay. Because there's some interesting... First of all, the date. Did anything jump out at you with the date? It says March 30th, 24, not 2024. Yep, that's one thing. What's the other thing? There's one other thing in there. Uh, hmm. Look at the 30. 
Oh, is that a is that an O? It's an O. Uh huh. It's not a zero. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. No, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. Well, see, that's how they get you. you feel stupid? Nope. <laughs> I'm a you're, human, you're Dave. better man than me. <laughs> uh, skipping down to the receipt number. What's wrong with the word receipt? Uh, it is misspelled. It is misspelled. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and then going further down, uh, there's a little typo. Please contact us at to cancel the plan. Right. That's a, a, a giveaway. But then the phone number itself also. Oddly uh, spaced. Oddly spaced. And so those it's are not, probably O's instead of zeros. Right. There's a couple of zeros in the phone number that are probably O's, not zeros. And there's weird spacing so that the automation would had would have trouble figuring out the spam catcher would have trouble figuring out right that this was indeed a phone number yes so yeah it's interesting but uh, you know tip of the hat to michael for doing all the right things in fact the uh the last three of the phone number dave i just set it all to lowercase it is not 010 it is o i o <laughs> it's like old McDonald has a phone right, number. Exactly. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, Michael, thank you for sending this in. And again, tip of the hat to you for doing all the right things and taking a deep breath and slowing yep. down and um, not falling for this. But yeah. I, I think you're a reminder that this is when they get you, right? You're under stress. You're That's surrounded exactly by right. chaos. And it's so easy to overlook this. It can Very happen, much like your story today. It can happen to anybody. Yep. Yeah. So thank you for sending this in. Again, if you have something you'd like us to consider for our catch of the day, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. Back to the concept of integrations. Nobefore's Security Coach uses standard APIs to quickly and easily integrate with your existing security products from vendors like Microsoft, CrowdStrike, Cisco, and dozens of others. Security Coach analyzes alerts your security stack generates to identify events related to any risky security behavior from your users. With this information, you can set up real-time coaching campaigns to target risky users based on those events from your network, endpoint, identity, or web security vendors. These campaigns enable you to coach your users at the moment the risky behavior occurs, with contextual security tips delivered via Microsoft Teams, Slack, or email. With 35 integrations and counting, Security Coach delivers the insight you need to improve your organization's security culture. Learn more about Security Coach at knowbefore.com slash security coach. That's knowbefore.com slash security coach. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Robert Blumoff. He is the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at Akamai, uh, certainly a well-known tech company. Here's our conversation. We're in, in the middle of what I think we'd have to call a generative AI mania. And I think that the narrative is all over the, the map. Um, I've oftentimes referred back to a quote from the, uh, from the science fiction writer and, and futurist uh, Arthur C. Clarke who says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm. And so I think we're in this weird phase right now where, you know, generative AI, well, AI more broadly is affecting pretty much all of our lives in rather dramatic ways, but to the vast majority uh, of the population, it really is indistinguishable from magic. And that creates um, an opportunity uh, to, to, to frame things in any number of ways um, from you know, utopian benefits to a future society to dystopian darkness that, that's going to overtake us all. And it's really hard to navigate the, the reality from, from the hype, uh, both, both the good hype and, and the bad hype. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I think uh, myself, having grown up uh, in the 80s, I, I hear people joke about how you know, we came up expecting that maybe we'd get Star Trek, but it, instead maybe we got uh, Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, right. 
Yeah, well, I, mean, I think we all thought, you know, those of us who grew up, uh, you know, you know, I'm actually, I was born in the 60s and, you know, that was a, the golden era of, of aviation and, you know, from uh, space travel and, and uh, you know, to the, to the Concorde and the 747 and the SR-71. And then at least from an outsider's point of view, it seems to all just have come to a, a, a stop. But, you know, if you're in, if you're in that industry, it's a whole different story, I'm sure. But to an outsider, you know, the planes of today look roughly like the planes of 50, 60 years ago. They travel about the same speed, with the exception, of course, of the Concorde, which doesn't even exist anymore. But what we couldn't have forecast, what I think we all were just completely surprised by, was what's happened in telecommunications. Um, just just astounding, um, some of which has been, obviously, to just tremendous benefit. And yet, yeah, there is this dark side. You know, I, I think folks talk about this idea of a, a cyber 9-11 or, or a, a cyber Pearl Harbor. We haven't seen that come to pass yet. Um, when you hear people use those kinds of terms, that kind of breathless uh, approach, what do you think about that? Well, you know, since you know we're talking about AI and generative AI, I think these ideas have been been put forward with with AI probably more than any other particular area of of, uh, of technology. You know, this idea because we've all seen movies. You know, the, the, you know AI takes over um, and attempts to kill us all. That's been the the, the subject of multiple movies. Of course, we all know that the Terminator movies. And, and I think there has been a lot of speculation and, and, and worry about these so-called doomsday scenarios, um, which I think are, personally, I think we're, we're far, far away from anything like that. Very hypothetical. And, you know, ironically, I think in many ways it's giving, um, it, you know, it's giving the current technology maybe more credit than, than, it, than it deserves. You know, because one of the things that we've learned as we all get experience with, say, large language models or other forms of generative AI is that there's a number of things that it's really not good at. One of those things is planning. Uh, these, these systems are not good at planning. They oftentimes, by the way, give the semblance of, of planning by oftentimes being able to produce an output that looks like a plan and maybe even is a good plan, but that's different than actual planning. And if these things are going to take over, well, they're going to need to do some planning. Um, and I And I don't think that that the current technology or anything that we're going to have in the near future has anything resembling the kind of planning capabilities that would be required for these sorts of uh, doomsday uh, terminator scenarios. But the thing that really kind of that gets me is that a lot of the um, conversation that focuses on this doomsday scenario, which is so hypothetical and I think just at this point not really worth time, is taking away from the conversation that we need to be having, which is you know, instead of talking about the doomsday scenario, which is hypothetical and probably not happening, what about the very, very bad day scenario, which is happening um, and is going to happen with increasing uh, frequency? And so I, I worry that the, the conversation becomes dominated by this sort of doomsday conversation and we're not spending enough attention talking about the very, very bad day scenario because we're going to have a lot of very bad, we're going to have a lot of bad days uh, thanks to AI. Hmm. Well, what are some of the, the realistic perils that, that you see uh, potentially affecting us here? What, what are your concerns? Well, you know, it, it stems from, you know, this idea of, of, of deep fakes, social engineering. Um, you know, that, that's really, I think, at the core of probably what the biggest, biggest worry that I have is, you know, I remember, by the way, it was probably a couple of years ago, maybe when I first started seeing this technology emerging, um, you first start to get experience playing with large language models, and you start getting some experience playing with these image generators. Um, and I remember that back then, probably the very first demos I ever saw, almost all of them had a flavor of what, what I call mimicry. Of uh, it was, you know, you would ask the large language model, you'd say something like, "Please write a a user manual in the style of the author Tom Wolf," mm. or or something silly, you know, please generate a, um, you know, an image of, of cats playing on the moon in the style of, uh, of Matisse. And, and, and the results are, of course, are just, just stunning, the, the results that you get from instructions like that. And I remember seeing these demos and thinking, why? <laughs> you know, why is it that these systems have the ability to do this kind of mimicry? Because it's so dangerous. You immediately think about, or at least I did, immediately think about the bad ways in which people could use 
this mimicry capability. You know, we've seen examples of that uh, recently. You know, we saw you know headlines about uh, the the deep fake uh, Joe Biden phone calls, which is I think just the the tip of the iceberg, or just maybe sort of the beginning of of a lot more to come. But my point being, I, just back then, I, I was sort of perplexed because you know I believe that the people who you know the the engineers, the scientists who created these tools you know, they're not trying to do harm. They, they want to build good tools. They want to build things that are going to help us all and, 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 do, um, and do good. So it does beg the question, well, why did they include this ability to do mimicry? And it took a little bit of time for me to sort of get under the covers and understand more about how these things work when I realized that it's kind of inherent in what these things are. The engineers who built these large language models and these stable diffusion models and whatnot, they didn't actually program in any notion of mimicry, but rather it's simply inherent in what these things are. Because remember, they're trained on, you know, all the text, say, on the internet or on the web, whatever, or trained on the various images that are available. So, of course, there's, Im you know, images of, of Matisse paintings, and of course, there's writings from Tom Wolfe. So once the system's been trained on these things, of course, it has the ability to produce output in the style of Tom Wolfe or in the style of, uh, of Matisse. So it's inherent in, 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 these, in, in what the technology is. And in fact, the challenge actually is putting the guardrails back in to make it so that you can't misuse that capability. It's actually taking mimicry out is much harder than putting the mimicry in because it, it's just an inherent part of the way these, these, these models work. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating insight. I, I mean, my understanding... It and albeit incomplete, is that at their core, these things are probability engines. And so, you know, that's a big part of how they end up, which what people describe as, as, as an illusion of intelligence or sentience or however you want to describe it. Uh, do, you, do you think it's realistic to expect that we can put meaningful guardrails on these systems? That is a great question. You know, and by the way, you, you make the, the point about ascribing some notion of, of sentience to these things. I, I think there's a natural tendency to want to ascribe some notion of intelligence to anything that can carry on a conversation. Um, and, and I forget who I first heard say that. So, um, somewhere along the line, I read somebody wrote that or somebody said, or I heard somebody say that. Um, so I'm actually now mimicking somebody else. <laughs> um, but, but I like that insight. It, it's, it's absolutely true. If something that can carry on a conversation, you want to ascribe intelligence to it. But um, as we've seen, it's possible to carry on a conversation simply through this, as you said, probabilistic model, simply through this, this simple model that's basically, you know, looking at patterns of text and then calculating reasonable probabilities for, you know, how do you continue that, that text pattern? Uh, or in the case of images, you know, what are some reasonable probabilities for sort of, if you will, kind of next pixels or next patches of pixels? The question then, yeah, you're asking about, well, guardrails, it's hard. Uh, from everything that, that I've seen you know, first of all, again, the recognition that the guardrails are kind of put in after the fact. Mm. The, the ability of these things to be used to do harm, like mimicry and deepfake and whatnot, that's inherent in what the thing is. And so governing that and controlling that is done through, as you said, the, this mechanism of guardrails, which is sort of an after-the-fact mechanism. It's something that has to be put in after the fact. And, and I think what we're seeing is that it's remarkably hard to do. You know, we read about jailbreaks, people are publishing so-called jailbreaks. And even without people intentionally going through jailbreaks and breaking through the guardrails, it, it happens very frequently accidentally. And we also see um, unintended consequences. You know, uh, for example, you know, we saw this with, um, uh, you know, Google Gemini, where they basically have had to pull back because it was producing some really odd output. And all of that, as far as I understand it, was a consequence of good intentions. You know, the engineers at Google wanted to put in reasonable guardrails to make sure that their models were not perpetuating biases or doing other bad things. So the intention was very, very good, but the execution is so difficult that they ended up with um, unintended consequences. And so the net net is that my sense is that Guardrails are really, really hard, not only because they can be broken by people intentionally breaking them, but because they can have unintended consequences and oftentimes don't do um, what you want them to do. 
I'm curious what, what you and your colleagues there at Akamai are seeing in terms of the adoption by cyber criminals, by scammers of these kinds of tools. Where does the focus seem to be? Well, it, it, so absolutely, the, the, the cyber criminals are absolutely adopting these tools. I actually think that, you know, if you're a cyber criminal, you could make the case that uh, November 30th, 2022 was the greatest day in your life because that was the day that OpenAI announced ChatGPT. And I'm not trying to throw ChatGPT in particular under the bus, but that was the day, the moment that set off generative AI mania. If you were a cyber criminal, your, your, your eyes lit up and you realize that there's now this whole new type of tool that either is already available or will soon be available to you to do um, some really dramatic uh, things. So, um, and I think we're at the early stages of that. You know, I've oftentimes talked about sort of a large, uh, long arc of cybersecurity is, I think, you know, for many, many years, maybe even decades, you know, if you, if you, if you say cybersecurity, you know, goes all the way back to, say, the beginning of the web or the, even the beginning of the internet, maybe you want to pick out, uh, I think 1988 was uh, the Robert Morris worm, maybe call that day one. So we've been dealing with, with, the, with cybersecurity for, um, for decades now. And for most of that history, aside from, say, nation states, the primary actor that we were concerned with was the so-called hacktivist who was really just doing these things to make a point, to show off to friends. Um, they would perpetrate these attacks sort of once in a while. And by today's standards, I would also say they were very un unsophisticated. You know, so forward to today, where I think if we look back, it's really just been a handful of years, two, three, four years now, where the landscape changed and the dominant bad actor went from being a hacktivist to a criminal who's voted, who's motivated by money. They're very organized. They have very sophisticated tools. And now it's no longer just perpetrate a, an attack once in a while. It's they're, they're literally going on constantly. Um, and the tools, you know, are, are effective. They're scalable so they can go down market. Very sophisticated. And as soon as you put, you know, money as the motivation, as opposed to say, make a point or show off to your friends, um, that changes the game dramatically. Uh, and, and I think we've seen that over the last few years with the rise of ransomware, extortion attacks, things like that. The, the level of malignancy, the level of potency of these attacks has gone up dramatically just over the last few years. And I think what we're going to see now is over the next few years, those same bad actors as, as good as the, and power, not good, they're bad, but as powerful as they, as they are today, they're going to get considerably more powerful because I think the next few years are going to be dominated by them adopting these tools um, and focusing heavily on things like social engineering. Joe, what do you think? I like how he starts off with Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah. Um, my, my opinion of Arthur C. Clarke is that he was a techno prophet, Dave. Yeah. Um, the guy predicted so much stuff. Uh, and these LLMs are like magic to us. Mm. So it, it, he's right about, he was right about that, that if you, if you don't understand um, the technology, uh, people are going to think it's magic. I mean, go, I, I frequently fantasize about time, time travel. I don't yeah. know why I waste my time doing this. It's, okay. But <laughs> I, I imagine going back to, you know, the, uh, the Salem witch trials and pulling a phone out. Right. <laughs> they burned you at the stake for that. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of thing. Michael Crichton, also, a uh, great predictor of technology, one of actually more of a techno philosopher. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of his, one of his statements from Jurassic Park uh, applies here that you're, you're so busy wondering if you can do something, you never really stop to think if you should do something. Right. And uh, we're all familiar with Jeff Goldblum's line from that, or if you read the book, uh, yeah. his character's line. I never read the book, I only saw the movies because mm. I like dinosaur movies. I've read other <laughs> Michael Crichton books. Yeah. Um, when we're looking at the future, it, it tends, you know, we think utopian or dystopian, you know, Star Trek or, or, uh, or Blade Runner. Right. I'm leaning towards Blade Runner, Dave. Much yeah. more dystopian. Certainly lately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the impact of the internet as a whole, I mean, not, not just everything. That, I mean, just we never could have predicted the impact of the internet. Yeah. This has been huge. Yeah. I, I will say the thing that I never saw coming, like when I was, because I, I was pretty active with computers and, mm -hmm. and all, as all this stuff came about. And I know you were too. Yes, I was. I remember sitting there and, you know, in the days of dial-up modems, the thing that I did not 
predict, the thing that I could not envision was the wireless internet was the... The Wi-Fi. Well, Wi-Fi, uh, you know, all of the, the our mobile devices. Oh, okay. That there would be ubiquitous wireless connectivity. Oh, right, yeah. Ubiquitous wireless, wireless data connectivity. Right. Uh, pretty much no matter where you are. Yeah. That I did not see coming. I thought you'd just have faster modems, right? Right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 5,600 kilobaud. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I just lacked the vision to see that that... And in retrospect, it's obvious, but... Uh, at the time, I just didn't think, didn't didn't have the the vision to see that being the inevitable outcome. Yeah, I don't know that I I saw that, but as soon as it became available, like with with uh, right when the iPhone came out, I was mm-hmm. like, this is just going to get more widely available and cheaper yeah. over time. And now everybody has unlimited data on their phone. Right. right? Um, I even have a hotspot on my phone where I can use my phone as a as a as a Wi Fi access point. Sure. And work anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, as long as there's, as long as I have a cell phone connection, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, there are some places where that doesn't work, but, um, uh, it, it, it works most places. Talking about the, uh, the cyber Pearl Harbor event, or maybe the Skynet event, uh, mm-hmm. if we're going to make movie references all day, I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, I, I agree that we are pretty far from that. Um, we can always just power off these systems as well. That's, one of the things, and now I'm making a Matrix reference as well. The, the difference between, uh, you know, Skynet and an LLM is at some at some point somebody can walk up and turn off enough machines that that Chat GPT stops working, mm-hmm. right? Um, these AI systems are not good at planning. I'm kind of relieved to hear that. <laughs> of course, right now there's some AI researcher going. Ah, that's an interesting <laughs> research sure. problem. Yeah. yeah. Soon they will be good at playing. We can edit that part out. And then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then then they will be good at planning, and then humans are history. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, but I, I, I like what Robert's talking about here. Worrying about the cyber Pearl Harbor event is not as important as worrying about the very bad day event, mm. which is a much more realistic problem that actually happens to companies and organizations within governments and NGOs all the time. Yeah. It, you can't watch the news without hearing about another very, some company having a very bad day. Sure. Um, I like the discussion about the why mimicry. What is it that, that these things are doing that, that's mimicry? And that's, and that's because that's ontologically what these things are. They're mimics. These LLMs are just mimics. Yeah. Um, you really can't take the mimicry out because if you take that out, You've taken away the ability of the of the of the model to perform. Uh, you're correct in these your statement that you made here, and that's that all of these systems give the illusion of intelligence or sentience. Right. Uh, that there there's nothing there. There's no there there, if you will. Um, yeah, I wonder if that is ultimate will ultimately be a distinction without a difference. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, and then there, there are the people who who philosophize about: uh, Are we even there? Mm-hmm. You know, do, do our consciousness is real? And that's where I that's where I check out, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I go. Okay, now you're getting way too pedantic arguing sure. about something that I'm just not going to go down that road with you. <laughs> uh, the best we can do is put guardrails in after the fact because of the uh, nature of these things. But people jailbreaking these guardrails and and getting around the guardrails is going to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, also, there are models out there with no guardrails you can just download. Mm-hmm. And if you have a powerful enough computer, you can run them. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a problem, uh, or the problem that uh, Robert was talking about with Gemini and with all of these things, that, all these LLMs, is that at the bottom of all of these models, there is the training data. And maybe that data has some biases in them. Or perhaps the data um, is not biased, but the model inferences we believe to be incorrect, mm-hmm. right? You remember Tay? Yes. That, that yes. was all I do. biased data, right? Microsoft's Tay, yeah. 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 It lasted 16 hours on Twitter, Dave, <laughs> before, it, before it became a neo-Nazi and they had right. to shut it down. Yeah. Uh, hilarious, yeah. but uh, MS <laughs> then replaced it with Zoe, right? Which was criticized because it, the, it was, uh, in order to avoid controversy, they had to introduce biases. Yeah. So it, even putting these guardrails on, those guardrails are a form of bias. Yeah. Like I say, the you know, the the 
we want these things to behave in the way we aspire to be as as humanity. That that's and, an excellent observation. And they Dave. behave as we actually are. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. These things be, behave like uh, like like teenagers on four chan. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a distillation of of yeah. everything we are as humans, good and bad. Right. And Absolutely. to pretend otherwise, I, I think, is folly. I, I would agree with you 100%. I, I would agree with that 100%. These things are more of a mirror to humanity than we would like to admit. Right. And it's uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah. We don't like who's in the mirror, do we, mm-hmm. Dave? Mm-hmm. Uh, cyber criminals are going to use these things like crazy. Robert is correct. We are only at the early stages of this. I am convinced there are people out there developing, uh, training LLMs to be malicious actors. They are going to get more powerful it's not just going to be social engineering attacks. These LLMs are going to help in all stages of, of the attack, including the reconnaissance, the initial access, spreading throughout a network. These things are going to uh, really help people with a low skill set become a much more higher skilled actor. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's coming. Uh, so if you're not being prepared for that, then <laughs> you, you should be being prepared for that. Right. Uh, Zero trust and micro seg- segmentation are very helpful for for this. Um, zero trust in that every time something is done, uh, authentication is verified uh, and authorization is verified. Uh, the micro segmenta- segmentation, uh, I like that idea as well. Just making sure that there <laughs> that you you if you're on a VLAN of one device, that's okay, right? You almost never need to see uh, your your Coworker's computer from a network standpoint, mm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Because how are you? How do I send the file to you? I'm going to email it to you. I'm going to send it across this chat application. But, well, that's you going out to a server and then me going out to a server. Right. There's no need for us to be able. To, we don't have file sharing. We don't really use those file sharing uh, capabilities anymore. Like the uh, the old Windows Share directory. Right. Right. We don't we don't do that anymore. There's there's things like SharePoint. Right. That make it possible to not have to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, again, our thanks to Robert Blumoff for joining us. Again, he is the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology at Akamai. And uh, we do appreciate him taking the time. Really interesting conversation. We want to thank all of you for listening. And, of course, we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are experts at enabling a fully integrated approach to security awareness training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. We want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. A quick reminder that N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producers are Jennifer Iben and Brandon Karp. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening.